I'm just going to say a very, very short introduction because I know this is a beautifully crafted talk and I know you're going to explain this entire project. But we have been very lucky to have Dulce and Fatima with us for three weeks and they've come from Senegal, from a brilliant organisation, Raw Material Company, that I know a lot of people in Scotland are really interested in, and artists that have been here and that, that we know well, like Tafa Tal and Alberta Whipple, have already worked with, with yourselves. But we're doing an institutional and an artist residency exchange, which has been funded by British Council Scotland. And so this is the first stage, welcoming Dorsey and Fatima here. So they've had the opportunity to live and work alongside Cove Park and be involved in every aspect of our programme and have been amazing. We don't want you to go. Um, and then very soon in November, December, we will welcome the Senegalese photographer Ibrahima Tayam uh, for an eight week, six or eight week residency, a long, a really good long period of time in Scotland. And then an artist from Scotland, based in Scotland, Julianne Feronda, will be travelling to Senegal next year. And hopefully, and in fact definitely, um, members of the Cove Park team will also travel <laughs> to Senegal to learn a lot from, from you all there. So I won't explain much more because I know you will, but I did want to thank you both and to thank British Council for making all of this possible and Dom who's here today and again for everyone for coming. Thank you. So I'm Dorsey and this is Fatima um, and we're both programme curators at Raw Material Company. So first of all, yeah, thank you Alexia so much for everything that you've done yes. in bringing us here, welcoming us embedding us in the team um, and to all of the team at Cove Park. I'm going to name them all, this is important to us. Um, and I'm sorry if I forget anyone, but Alexia, Francesca, Katrin, Sarah, Emma, Caitlin, Karen, Nicola, Lynn, Rona, Maeve, Rebecca, and the one bloke, Kevin, <laughs> who um, just have yeah, made something that seemed quite impossible Totally possible and amazing. Um, and also thanks to our fellow residents, some of, whom, yes. some of whom are here and who have made this such a big experience for yeah. us. Um, and also our colleagues back in Dakar who, you know, would love to have been here today. Um, and thank you to all of you for coming, uh, some of you quite a, a, a distance. Um, so we are, as Alexia said, here on an institutional residency. So here's just a couple of, or well, a few images that show Cove Park and then show um, Dakar. And that's the bottom right hand picture is the street, the Rue Sans Soleil, where Raw Material Company is situated. Um, one of the reasons why this partnership seems so interesting to us is because we work in such different contexts. I don't think you can get much more diametrically opposed than Cove um, in Western Scotland and uh, Point Eau neighbourhood in Dakar in Senegal. Um, but we've got, you know, we do share some issues like having to watch out for the livestock on your way to work in the morning. Um, but I suppose that's just a sort of light way of saying that despite working in such different contexts, one of the things that's been so illuminating to us is seeing the concerns that we share. Um, and that's important in practical terms, but it's also really important to keep us going, to know that there are colleagues around the world and collaborators who are engaging in the same issues as us, whether that be climate change or how you work with a team full of women, you know, and the kind of questions that that raises um, in practical terms. It's, it really helps us to feel like we're part of something, so um, these kinds of exchanges can be phenomenal for that. And also, you know, one of the reasons why we participate in exchanges like this um, is because when you work in an art institution, like in any institution, you can become sort of institutionalized, and you take things as a given. You know, you sort of that's the way we do things at Raw, um, and getting out, and while I think what we do at Raw is great, <laughs> it's really important to get out, to see how other institutions are doing things, and um, a residency within an institution is one of the best ways to see that, to actually see how on a day-to-day -day basis things can be done differently, um, or see things that you're doing that are working well. So um, it's a really, yeah, amazing experience. Um, and 
I will pass over to Fatima, who's going to talk more about the context of Senegal and sort of artistic and cultural history out of which war emerged. So. so, in fact, we give you a bit of context in order that you guys understand how, of course, we we decided to uh, Koyoko decided to implement raw material company in Dakar. So um, we, by the late 60s, uh, of course, Dakar get its, uh, Senegal get its independence and uh, the president of Senegal, Leopold Sedar Senghor, who was a writer and a poet, uh, alongside with his fellow Aimé Césaire, created before that, in the 30s, a movement, a movement called La Negritude. And it was a lot about how we can make people uh, from African descent being able to be really proud of what they are and what they have to give to the world and how they can share it through culture, literature, uh, of course, writings, etc. And when the president Leopold Sedar Senghor was elected in will of take the leadership in Senegal, he <laughs> He decided to develop, of course, many things for the Senegal, the new Senegal and those new African countries, but it was really important for them to do it through culture. And culture was a, a, a very important mean for diplomacy, of course, and spreading our culture and our identities around the world, but also uh, in order to, yes, find ways in which he can make us uh, prove to the world that we are able, of course, being African, to give something else or to share something else than the past colonial history. So he created during, uh, yes, yeah, 30 years, about during 30 years, he developed a wide cultural policy uh, centered on the art and among the institutions he created, there was a school of architecture, a school of art, one of the first of the African continent. He created as well a manufacturer where we were used to do tapestries and the students from the school of art were connected to this manufacturer as well. And uh, among all those different institutions, he created one we, he developed with uh, Présence Africaine, which is a publishing house in France uh, run by Alion Diop, late Alion Diop. Uh, he created what we call the first B World Festival of Negro Art. So this was one of the biggest gathering of uh, artists, intellectuals, writers, singers, whatever you can imagine. There was 2,500 artists at this event in Dakar. So it was, there were 30 countries as well, countries from the continent, countries from Europe, which were connected and linked to the program, and also countries uh, from the diaspora, so African-American coming from the United States, people from Car the Caribbean, and many, many, many other identities being all melted into Dakar and celebrating just their identities and what does it mean to be all together and just show to each other as well. Uh, how we built our culture because, of course, being in Dakar and in all those different countries, much of us don't know each other. And uh, it comes in when we, it comes to speak about Africa, people imagine that we are all, all together and speaking together and knowing each other, but no, we have to know each of us culture. And uh, this festival we call now First Man was a very good way to do that. And uh, I think that the First Man was one of the main event to, taking place in Dakar and giving also the impulse for other events like that to take place uh, in countries like Nigeria. Nigeria, Nigeria got a fest stack in 1770. The festival of Dakar was in 6060. Nigeria held one in 7070 with another perspective, but brilliant perspective as well. And uh, we have another festival like that in Alger later and uh, so I think that those different events taking place into different countries in the continent also uh, impulse something in how people are seeing now Dakar like a place where things can start or it could be a starting point for the cultural art scene. So uh, in the 90s after um, President Leopold Sedar Senghor think about, of course, the Festman and those different institutions, but he also think about the Dakar Biennale, which is a two, every two years event. And at the beginning, this Biennale was uh, an event focused on 
literature and uh, writings, I think, connected, of course, with this movement de la negritude. Mm -hmm. And in 1960, the Biennale became, 19, no, 1996, <laughs> the Biennale became an event focused on contemporary African art. So since this time, the Biennale is running every two years, except the pandemic years 2020. So the next one will take place in next year. And uh, Inshallah. Inshallah yes. <laughs> the next one will take place next year. But this Biennale is basically the, the event that put us, Dakar, I mean, in the map of the contemporary art scene, a global contemporary art scene. So you have many artists coming from all over the world. At a certain point, there was this discussion about the Biennale being focused on Senegalese artists and being uh, widely open, and now it is. And we have uh, many artists coming from all over the continent, from the diaspora, and even European artists taking part into that. But it's really important for us that it's a kind of celebration of what is uh, what is happening in those in our communities, and then uh, it's every two years, and we have the focus on Dakar at this moment, and many art practitioners are coming to share uh, this with us. So you are really welcome. To come. <laughs> 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 but uh, what I have to say as well is that. The cultural policy run by President Leopold Sedar Senghor was really um, connected to the legacy we have as a former colonial country. So the model was developed connected to what we used to see in France and how it was developed there and in European countries. And uh, something happened in 1974, the Laboratoire Agitart was created by uh, artist Issa Somb, we call it with a lot of affection, Joachim, and uh, with uh, uh, his friends, the filmmaker Ousmane Semben, the dramaturge Yusufa John, and uh, Elsie, another artist. And they decided to create this place in order to be, uh, yes, to create a kind of contre-courant uh, from what culture? Counter culture. Thank you, Dulcie. It's uh, way sexy when you say A counter culture and uh, to be able to create an art scene where it's not only dedicated or linked to people who actually has what we call an education, a formal education, and that have been educated to like art and to have a notion of aesthetic. When it's come to the Laboratoire Agitart, they are really, really connected into having all together writers, harvesters, people who work on the land, uh, people who are in the society and who don't get any education, but who have a sense of aesthetic and who are in their own culture and who can share that and we can celebrate that as well. So it was really, really important for them to create a place for solidarity, for, uh, yes, also a place where people can very freely uh, discuss about many different things and build together projects. So there was a lot of happening, uh, installation, and of course, um, place. Yes, place. In Merci Dulcie. <laughs> and uh, so, regarding the Laboratoire Agitart, I think that they give a kind of uh, new impulse to the art scene in Dakar. And so we always have that, having the academical format and those kind of, uh, yes, underground current of art. And it's really, really important for us to be able to mix them all. And um, in addition to that, since, uh, I think, 2016, the parcours? Parcours, uh, 2011. No? 11, at the beginning of... Okay. This is the 10th anniversary. Ten, you, you are right. <laughs> so, Parcours is an event that uh, was created by Koyoko. Koyoko is the founding director of Rose. She is an art curator. And uh, she's still our artistic director. We send her a big bunch of love. And uh, Koyoko, with Mauro Petroni and uh, other institutions in Dakar, decided to create this event called Parcours. And now we are working off the 10 years and anniversary publication of Parcours, and I don't know why I'm not remembering that it was 2011, <laughs> but still, Parcours is this event taking place in Dakar every year, or in December, and it was really created to kind of federate the whole artistic ecosystem 
each time a year rather than all waiting that the Biennale happen and just uh, waiting every two years to make things happen. And there is, there is always this thing in Dakar where people are saying, but nothing happened in Dakar. We have to wait until the Biennale arrives. There is no exhibition, there is nothing, there is no program. And then we are just like, many things happen. You don't <laughs> get the programmation, you, don't, you didn't go in our space. So it was a beautiful way also to build a, Commun uh, and uh, communal communication and also share what we are doing uh, time to time, our program and making people knowing what we were doing as well. So we have now 26 space and during the pandemic it's fantastic because we added to the parkour core uh, six new space that opened during COVID-19 and a very various space and we have a new sense of what the Dakar art scene is and uh, might look like, am I okay? <laughs> <laughs> you good. So, so as you can see, Dakar, is that okay? Yeah, yes, as you can see, oh yes, this is you. As you can see, Dakar art scene is really, how do you say, many things happen there, but we are not the, oh, the only one. I mean, in Lagos, it's fantastic, Cape Town as well, Marrakech, we just, many, many things are happening in the continent. The chance we got is that we have a legacy and a real heritage concerning contemporary art and how you can accompany people and how you can build things so that you have a, an ecosystem where people can work and uh, create together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think particularly probably seeing what parkour is, you maybe start to get a sense that raw works very much in relation to its environment and raw actually was created to respond to what was identified by Koyo as a need, you know, a gap that needed to be filled. In Dakar you can see that there was, there's been a very, very vibrant artistic scene for decades um, but that something that was missing was a space where one could engage in critical discourse around art and where art and art making in its wider sense could be embraced and could be given a space to be documented, archived, but also where it could generate new discourse. Um, and so Queer often speaks about the fact that you know, she did, never wanted to create an art institution, but she was tired of people visiting Dakar and having to excuse <laughs> for the fact that there was no place like that. Um, so Raw was founded as an idea in 2008, um, and then it became a physical space in 2011. Um, it's an independent art institution, so that means we don't get public funding from the state. I think that's maybe, from our few weeks in Scotland, it seems like that's, that's quite different. Um, but I think it also relates to the relationship that people might have to the state. Um, you know, in, in, in Senegal it can be quite a conflictual relationship and uh, there's also funding issues. Uh, and Fatima explained, you know, in great depth and with great richness, everything that Leopold Sida Senghor did mm -hmm. for culture, um, but in the 1980s yes. when there were structural adjustment programs all over the world, there was enforced austerity, which meant that culture, not just culture, schools, hospitals, infrastructure was funding was cut in Senegal. So there was this real gap, you know, um, in the ensuing years. So Raw was founded. Um, just a couple of words on Raw Material Company. I think sometimes it's a bit of a mystery as to why that's what we're called. Um, Queer really didn't want anything with like contemporary art, Africa in the name. Um, so Raw Material Company, I mean, Raw Material, it's a way of posing a question about what raw materials actually are. Um, Africa is known as the continent of raw materials, but it's often talking about extracting physical material. Um, and I suppose we're putting on the table that what's going on up here is also um, a real generator um, of some sort of wealth, not just monetary for the continent, but also company because um, we're not a company, we make no money. <laughs> you know, we are you know, not for profit, but um, we like to think that we are in good company. Um, and a lot of what we do is about kind of conviviality, working together. I think you can see that through parkour, but also other networks that we're part of. And 
to our eyes in any case, these three weeks in Scotland, it seems like there's a pretty good sense of conviviality as well amongst um, people working in, in art practice. So um, that's really nice to see. Um, so I'm just quickly going to quote um, Chimamanga. I'm not sure if you know Chimamanga, but it's a South African editorial platform who described what they do. We work very closely with them. Um, and in particular, this quote comes from a program that we worked on together, and I just think it kind of sums up our reason for being. Um, Unless we push form and content beyond what exists, then we merely reproduce the original form, the colonized form, if you will. It requires not only a new set of questions, but its own set of tools, new practices and methodologies that allow us to engage the lines of flight, of fragility, the precariousness, as well as joy, creativity, and beauty that defines contemporary African life. Um, so, we try and do that. <laughs> um, yes, please. Um, so, one of the reasons that Raw became a physical space as well is because um, there was nowhere to access literature on contemporary art, um, and in particular contemporary African art on the continent. Um, and Koyu had loads of books and it, there was an impetus to sort of make those books available for people. So the library to this day is one of the like, main jigsaw pieces of raw, um, not just physically, but also in terms of bringing people into the space. So we have an ever-growing collection of books that focus on contemporary African art, but again, in its broader sense, so we have lots of cultural theory, we have architecture, we have social history, political history, um, and we are in the neighbourhood where there, we're very near the main university, but we're also surrounded by um, business schools, management schools, uh, and we have Wi-Fi. So <laughs> we have students coming into the library um, to use the Wi-Fi because they've heard it's a nice place to work, and then we kind of go, oh, when have you heard about this book? And <laughs> And then because we have such a diversity of programming, um, they start coming for one thing and then they start, you know, really participating in the different programs and before we know it, we're seeing them every week and um, it's really simple but just kind of one of the main ways that we get people into the space who wouldn't necessarily go into a contemporary art space. Um, this is our residency, Claire Issa, so named after Issa Sam, who um, Fatima spoke about. Uh, the residency programme began when we began in 2011, so we've now hosted you know, over probably 50 artists, researchers, curators, and the idea behind the residency is to allow people to come and spend time in Dakar, Senegal, work with the curatorial team at War in their research, in their practice, uh, they don't have to produce anything at the end, but their project has to be relevant to Senegal. Um, so it's really important that the project is something that makes sense and is situated in the space. Um, and for us, it allows us always to get new perspectives mm -hmm. on Senegal, research new lines of inquiry, and we'll come back to the residencies in a minute, because uh, it's obviously one of the main things we have in common with Cove. Um, so, yeah, I'll let Fatima um, talk about, um, we've got a lovely roof terrace on the residence, <laughs> if anyone's interested in coming. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so, uh, these are a kind of bunch of different exhibitions that were hosted uh, since the opening. Exhibition always had been at the heart of what Ro was doing at. It was founded and run by, by an art curator, but... At a certain point, at the beginning, we used to host something like, I mean, eight to ten exhibitions a year. The team was composed of three persons, Koyo, marie Hélène, the actual director of program, and marie Cissé, the coordinator and projector. And so, until 2014, it was exhibition on exhibition on exhibition. And it was, of course, important for the art artists we want to promote, it was important for the subject we want to address, but in certain way we just ended up understanding that we were not talking to the people we want to talk with, because at the end of the day, we happened to receive for the different preview and vernissage all the 
elitist art scene and group of people coming here to just have this glass of wine or champagne and just being really happy to be here and to be seen there. And that was not the reason why Ro had been created and developed. So at a certain point, Koyo decided that we need a sabbatical year and we close raw material for one year and uh, raw reopen later with a new concept we will talk about raw academy after but i think that sabbatical was important for us because it was important to refocus being able to understand why we are doing things how we are doing it and even it's an art center perhaps exhibition could be a mean but not the the only thing, the only reason why we are doing things and the only tool, because most of the time we understand that they don't meet their audience. So finally, exhibition became a mean for us to address very important topics. It became also a mean, but at, uh, as having, giving exhibition the same place than publications, public program or symposium. So we decided sometimes we address a topic or a thematic or we are engaged in something and we understand that the main and the best answer for that is a book. So we do a book. If we understand that the main answer for that is a symposium, so we develop the whole program and we invite all our fellow curators, researchers, academic and also traditional practitioners. And I think that uh, in certain way, condition report is one of the... Yes, best answer we found. It was here since the beginning because condition report is started in 2012. But every two years, every two years, we host this symposium, and uh, it always addresses topics that agitate our context. So it's about, of course, the creation of uh, institution in Africa. It was one of the first condition report. The book is not here. It was one of the first condition report, and it was uh, quite interesting because we host many persons being on the continent, but also in the diaspora and engaging with those problematic and how you can run an institution knowing that each year you have to fight because you don't get any public fund and you rather be you you might close the year before, so you do everything with the fund you have and then you wait for God <laughs> in a certain way. So you are not, I mean, I think that we are in a certain way nurtured by the ecosystem and the people we are meeting and the subject we are engaging with. So we have a kind of fuel and we do it and we see how it happens. But uh, yes, sometimes it could be quite tricky, but here, oh, just, sorry. I'm sorry, just about condition report you have here, the. Third one on art history in Africa. You can see the books. It's, uh, uh, but it's an important one, I think, because uh, about Dulcie addressed it very well, and uh, the way in which Row is built it, and we think about being an art institution in our ecosystem. One of the reasons also that we received that appeal was that, in a certain way, we our art history doesn't belong to us. And there is a whole corpus of books, of exhibition, of, uh, I don't know, research on art history in Africa run by everything except the main person concerned about that. So in a certain way, we use the tools we have to gather those resources and to point out on the people who are in the African context, working with the people there and also in the diaspora and being able to, yes, depict what is the contemporary African art scene, is craft melted into it or no, and what we give values or not, and which artists we promote and for which reason. And I think that, uh, yes, you will have a look later. But uh, yes, the condition report are a very, very amazing tool for us to be with other people and also to share our knowledge. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and uh, one of the other tools are our public program. So we have, um, we call it Fridays at Row. Uh, it takes place every Friday. So depending on what is happening at Row, we have uh, a couple of months where we dedicated, uh, we are dedicated to those public programs. And of, among them, we have Vox Artis. So Vox Artis is a program where 
as you understand, we give voice to artists and also critics, curators, but also different kind of art practitioner. I mean, it's not only artists. And it's hosted by Masan Bambay, who is an art critic in our context. He's, and uh, we work with uh, Masamba since the beginning, and it's really interesting because it's also a place where the resident coming from abroad or the local resident can have an audience and can share their work with the public of Rome. We have uh, also a program we really love called Parlons Senegalaiserie, where we talk about Senegalese uh, issues, uh, Senegalese society issues or actualities and uh, so we can engage with all the topics you can imagine because it's really a place where we want everybody to come and just to ha hang out and being there and enjoying having a discussion with people who are usually not acknowledged just because they don't they are not academics or they don't have a PhD on something, but they have a lot of knowledge on traditional medicine. So, and the society is still connected to this knowledge. So you have to have them in, in order to be able, of course, to address all the part of the community. And we have also Rose in a Club. Rose in a Club is a platform where we can host uh, its, oh no, sorry, Parlo Senegalaiserie is run by uh, Ibu Fall, it's a journalist and a satirist, and the uh, Rose in a Club is host by Cisco, and uh, he is also an art critic and a journalist. So for the Rose in a Club, it's just to have the pulse of the cinematic, uh, cine mm -hmm. la scène cinématographique. <laughs> oh, the cinema scene. The cinema scene, oh my god, <laughs> the cinema scene in Dakar. Dakar have a really rich history on, on, on film scene and uh, so it's just a way to be able to accompany the young realizers, the young filmmakers. Filmmakers and break. things like that. I'm gonna do a break. <laughs> and uh, Citéology, and I'm gonna stop there. Citéology is a program which is interesting digging uh, the history of architecture in Senegal, urbanism, how we built, how we live in what we built, does it suit us or no, and why we are building like that. So we host many, many people, and it's host by Carol Job, an architect in Dakar, an amazing woman, and she redesigned our space also. So we work with the people we have at Row in many, many different ways, and I think that for that, we are really connected to what Cove Park do. <laughs> So, yes. So for the publication, from the beginning, Ro uh, started making publication because it was a way, obviously, for us to address the topic we were we used to engage with. And uh, one of the first books that we developed was in Bibliothèque Ideal. Just practically, Koyo sent an email to her friends, colleagues, and people she know in her network, and she asked them this question. If you decided to build a kind of bibliography or library, what would you put in it? Each of them sent a list, and a lot of them gave books also. So it was a beautiful way also for the artistic practice to understand which kind of corpus uh, each of the practitioner were addressing how they did it and which kind of books uh, nurture their practice. Uh, one of the other books we really like and that we published in uh, 2013, perhaps, or 12, 12? 12? It was a Chronique d'une révolte, Chronicle of a Revolt, and uh, we, I think we are really proud of this book because this book happened at a moment where Senegal was literally boiling for political reasons. And uh, you have all these young activists, political activists who were there in Senegal fighting about, uh, against the former president Abdoulaye Wad and the regime who decided just to don't respect the constitution and do whatever they do each, every single election coming. And uh, so the people were really, how do you say, engaged on this loot. And you have many activists like Yonama who create group in order to make the situation just reverse and make them stop and respect our constitution and what we wanted and how we want it because it's a really democratic country. And usually we, at this time, we were not facing this kind of issues, but now it's quite recurrent. And the Chronique d'une Révolte is uh, 
gather of uh, photography and texts uh, written by the people who were engaged in this loot. And this is how I think we can be into what is happening in the context and just producing someone, something, someone, something <laughs> that can address what is happening in the context practically. For this, uh, I think the answer was either an, an exhibition but also a book. And we have a, an amazing collection of pictures uh, taken during that, peri that period, and we got, uh, yes, the, there was a reverse, so I think that it's a kind of victory. Let's see for the next one coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're kind of in, as, as Fatima said, it's a recurring issue now, and our current program at Raw is very yes. much about this. And uh, for this page, I'm going to just point out Ibrahim Macham's book, Dune Rive à published during his exhibition in Dakar, so last year. And uh, Ibrahim, uh, but we're going to develop on that later, but you have the book just here. And uh, you can have a look if you want. And uh, just after that, uh, down in the slide, you have Breathing Out of School. It is one of the first books published and connected to what happened during uh, Dakar Ro Ro Academy. And uh, we are really proud of it. And there is contribution from uh, the fellows, so people who, had, who are here during the academy, but many, many other people. And it gave you a good sense of what's happened during this moment. It's a compilation of the five first academy, and it's re it will be released in October. <laughs> and maybe just also like yes. one word on it, uh, on our, our publications, which is a detail, but I think it speaks a lot to our approach in general. All of our publications are bilingual French and English. Yeah. Um, because, you know, Fatima spoke about how on the continent people might imagine that like, oh, it's all, but there's a vast amount of linguistic diversity. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a real schism between in communication between Francophone Africa and Anglophone Africa. And then there's also Lusophone Africa. Um, so it's yeah. really important to us that our books are available in both languages so that they can kind of circulate and be um, received and then of course criticised, yes, you know, course. discussed um, all across the continent and the diaspora. Um, so yeah, this is um, just quickly something that we worked on during the pandemic um, in Senegal, we have been really lucky we haven't been as badly affected as a lot of other places. Um, I'm not an epidemiologist, so I'm not going to go into theories as to why that is, but we were quite lucky. But we did have to close the space for a while. And like, you know, every arts organisation, you know, art space, we're wondering what do we do now? Um, we can't just transfer all of our programmes. I mean, 2020 was a year that was going to have two raw academies, one that was going to take place in the US, uh, a BNL, residencies, public programming. public programming, you know, how you can't just shift that online in the space of a few weeks. Um, and so we really took it as a time to research, to try a new format that we'd been wanting to explore but hadn't really had the time because we were so deep in our programming, um, which was, you know, audio. Um, and we thought, well, we have you know, this huge network of incredible thinkers and doers. And the question that we have is, what are we all going to do when this is over? You know, what world are we going to be moving into the morning after? At the time, I remember when we were working on the like, blurb for this program, it was like, in a few months. <laughs> Little did we know um, that we're now thinking of a much bigger time scale. But um, yeah, so we developed this podcast series where we sat down with virtually, obviously, um, artists, um, political scientists, journalists to imagine the morning after the pandemic. Um, so I think worth a re-listen now that we're actually <laughs> sort of emerging from it. Um, so now we're just going to give a couple of examples of artists who have gone through our residency program because um, I think it would be interesting to sort of think about that in relation to Cove Park um, but also because the Ibrahim and Cham Fatima will talk about is going to be coming here uh, in November. Um, but this would, yeah, I think just hopefully help you understand the process. Um, Christian Danielowicz is a Danish artist and he 
Uh, his work is really focused on giving material form to invisibilized processes of extraction all over the world. And he came to us uh, for a residency in 2018, and he was particularly interested in the phosphate mining uh, industry in Senegal. And so he arrived, and together with the curatorial team, we set, set up various trips so that he could try and get access to the mines, which are in a region just outside of Dakar, um, and try and get some photos, get some physical material. Impossible. Like, it was really, really, really hard to actually have access to the mines. But along the way, um, he found himself in um, a village called Gangonen, which is land that officially is not on the mining land, but it's basically encircled by mining land. Um, the companies who mine, I mean, it's a similar story everywhere. Um, you know, they've bought up the land, they've done dodgy deals, and Gagomen is kind of one of the last standing communities who are refusing to leave. Um, and they are, it's a village where the main source of income is agriculture. But their, for example, mango crops have been destroyed by the toxic pollution from the phosphate mine. Um, and so Christian, after his residency, felt that he was important to do something with this, um, with this research. And so he approached us and asked if we'd be interested in doing an exhibition. And we said yes, but particularly given the subject matter, it needed to go beyond an exhibition. Um, so we worked with him on an exhibition, a public program, but also workshops where we brought together um, people working in culture, but also activists, journalists who were interested in the question of climate activism and saving the environment in Senegal. Um, and so, you know, we worked with Gagomen um, on those workshops, but also on the public program. Um, there's a publication that uh, emerged from this as well, where we have texts from um, a philosopher who specialises in geopolitics, uh, but is also a secondary school teacher, uh, an art historian, and then we also republished an extract from the Living Convention, which is a really great document that some of you might know, laying out the rights of um, indigenous communities, uh, and it's been ratified by most countries on the planet, so it really shows what legally they can do, uh, but most people don't know it exists. So, um, yeah, the exhibition was kind of highlighting or, or, or showing, even smelling the cycle of, of, of phosphate um, from kind of cosmic stardust that lands on Earth through meteorites to fertilizer and kind of exposing the great irony that the same product which is used to create agricultural fertilizer is destroying life in Senegal. Um, and yeah, it's a project that um, we're really happy we were able to have the flexibility to give greater space to um, and bring in different stakeholders around. Um, so, yeah, just an example. And you can have a look at the, the book later if you want. <laughs> but it's a very long piece so this is one of the, it was um, 
sound pieces in the exhibition of Ibrahim Acham. So uh, the residency of Ibrahim Acham was really, it was a particular one because it's come out of COVID-19. In fact, we faced the fact that we used to host international residency program, but not any local artist residency program. We used to work with the local artists, uh, showing them into exhibitions, publishing books, etc., etc., but never host uh, any residency with them. And Ibrahima is one of those artists you have always them in your crowd. I mean, no matter what is happening at Raw, he's here. And the uh, last time we were looking at pictures and we see his heart in every single <laughs> even public program, symposium, and we are just like, oh my God, this guy is following us since a very, very long time. But still, Ibrahima is a photographer that we had invited uh, during the Royal Academy for a studio visit, for example, or for a Vox artist in order to let him share his practice with uh, the public of Raw. And uh, it's a photographer who is really interested in myth legends, orality, archive, and how you can archive the traditional oral history in Senegal. And he was working around the places that uh, the, the gods and goddess of the Lebu community have in our society and has a place they have in people's mind and people's rituals. And uh, this community, uh, depending on the ethnical group, but the Lebu have, in fact, Ibrahima is working specifically on the Lebu community, but there is a lot of resonance between the Lebu ethnical group and the Jola ethnical group, which are, whom are most in Casamos and also Sere ethnical group. It's all ethnical group who live in a certain way by the water, and they have gods and goddess connected and linked uh, to their, how do you say, tous les jours. Their daily life. Their daily life. And um, those figures are around, along the coast, uh, being there like sentinels in order to protect the people who are in the land, but also to pro protect the water and the species which are inside. And there is a lot of respect in the rituals they are creating and developing. And they are really into, because of those rituals and the, this, those beliefs, protecting the nature, protecting the sea, protecting the ecosystem, of course. So he first acknowledged the history of a god, goddess called Mamkumabang in Saint Louis, and then he, I'm sorry. No, 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 I read this. And this then, the Mamkumabang. So this is the first stage of his work. It was in 2019. It was one of his first theory. And at the beginning, it was a um, lot of uh, pieces uh, connected to traditional figures or traditional objects which are uh, relics for us. So he bring them into the photographies and it was really important for him to show how the people are engaging with the Saint Louis fleuve there. The, the river. The river, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. The Saint Louis river there and uh, how people don't go in the water without doing a sacrifice. So how people don't go in the, sacrifice means just pulling milk. Okay. <laughs> Nothing, Nothing more dramatic. dramatic. <laughs> and so, 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 so you go and uh, if you have a loss in this river, you, you have to go in a specific place, ask for this specific kid going to see the body on the, in the water. So there is a lot of um, belief in that and practice and croyance and people in Saint Louis are very, very, really connected to that. And even when you come, they say, did you pull something in the river? So we live like that and it's serious. And for example, if I go to the sea, my mom will tell me, did you pull the milk, milk in, the, in the sea before you go to swim? And so it's really serious and we believe in that, you know. And uh, Ibrahima is attached to give perspective on those different beliefs and croyances and also to, you know, all those stories are transmitted by counts. Counts? Tales. Tales. Yeah. Oh my, I'm sorry. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. So tales and uh, the kids are, usually the kids are by their, the, the, the f foot of their grandmother sitting there all Sunday or during the holidays and you, they, they just, tell you those stories, but now everything completely changed. So many, many kids of those community are not aware of those stories, so they don't behave like their grandbrother or grandsister or sister 
used to behave in the water, in the land, etc., etc. And he is really into. He had this chance, and he is really into uh, giving the possibility to people to have access to those stories because it's part of our identities. And uh, so we received Yerbaraima for residency of uh, two months, uh, completely, uh, how do you say, founded by Ro. And um, he, we produced the pictures, we made an exhibition, a public program, and a catalog. It's very important because you have trace in their parcours. And I think that uh, when, of course, we were approached by Cove Park, it was obvious for us that he has to be here in order to be able to <laughs> oh my god and we we speak with him a few weeks ago where we we're just like oh my god you're gonna just completely collapse because this place is amazing and you will take marvelous pictures and there is many stories as well here and i think that he wants to hear about it but he's really interested in also in how those communities by the sea are living from what is happening in the sea or not, if things change, disindustrialization, or many, many things happen, you know. And uh, I, I think that he's really keen on listening and hearing those stories and finding a way to, yes, demo, showing it in his pictures. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, so we hope you'll get to meet Mr. Bamer at some point when he's here. Yes. Um, I'm not sure how we're doing for time, Alexia, but we're nearly at the end. That's fine, we're all, and it'd be lovely to have a moment where everybody can ask you Yeah, no, we're totally, this is boring for, you know, we, we know what we do, but we're looking forward to hearing your questions. Um, but this is, yeah, we're nearly, we're nearly finished. So, um, there was the institutional sabbatical um, in 2014-2015. Um, it's also related to the funding question. Uh, you know, a lot of our organisations, particularly in Senegal, rely on project-by-project project funding. Um, and that might come from big NGOs or um, diplomatic, the kind of cultural diplomacy wings of, of foreign governments. Um, and they'll be for a project and the agenda has been defined by another country or people who are somewhere else. Or, um, and it's always been quite important for Raw to, as much as possible, try and establish relationships with funders that are long term um, and that are about us developing as an institution. Um, and where it's an equal partnership. Um, but of course, when you're kind of constantly making, making, doing, you know, you, it's very hard to have the, the sort of bandwidth to reimagine what you are as an institution. And so one of the reasons that Royal could take an institutional sabbatical is because it had the support. Um, not a lot, <laughs> you know, and it wasn't um, a fully funded year at Royal, but that kind of funding allows for an institution to kind of, okay, close the door for a little bit. And, and you know, in that time also, um, I mean, I started Raw just after that, but Marie-Hélène, for example, did institutional residencies similar to what we're doing. So a real moment of introspection, but also learning from other places. And the result was um, Raw Academy. So this, the idea that we needed to, in a more frontal way, address the issue of the kind of weak ecosystem around artists in Senegal and on the African continent where there are a ton of artists but you know very few curators very few art historians or if people are studying in those things how do they then create a network how do they also learn about these topics in you know anywhere that isn't the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris or you know somewhere where they're getting a certain type of learning so War Academy has a number of sort of goals, you know, but one of them is to develop new pedagogies around um, art making, um, but also to help young practitioners from different disciplines come together, um, learn from each other and develop their own networks, because it's really hard when you, you know, uh, have just finished art school. And it's something also that we've been impressed by being here, mm -hmm. is how much support there seems to be for recent graduates, um, but that doesn't exist in Senegal. So um, I won't go through all of the different sessions, um, but we the structure of it is that we have two different sessions each year. Let's take COVID out of the equation for a second. Mm -hmm. um, and each session is completely distinct. Um, we invite a lead faculty member, so 
It can be an artist, a curator, a collective um, who we think has an interesting practice. Um, and we know that there's a subject that they want to research and look into. They then kind of put meat on the bone of that subject and invite other faculty members. Um, and we do an open call for the fellows, and the fellows are the young practitioners, so we usually have about 10. They come from all over the world, and they come and spend seven weeks in Dakar with us, the lead faculty, and the other faculty members exploring this theme um, in the space of Dakar, in the space of Senegal, in RAW, in many different ways. Uh, and yeah, it's a pretty amazing experience. Also, as an institution, something worth mentioning about the academy is that when that happens, the curatorial team, we're a vessel for what the director is trying to do. And while that can at times be challenging, it also forces us to remain quite light on our feet as an institution and it obliges us to, to, to think differently about how we work for nearly half of the year, uh, which I don't think is such a bad thing for us. So um, I will just sort of pause on um, one of the upcoming sessions, because I think it's also relevant uh, with regards to this collaboration. Uh, it's infrastructure is what it's called, and it's the first one that's taking place outside of Dakar. So we were invited by the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia to do a session with them. Um, and the way that I like to think about this session is kind of a like nesting doll of infrastructures. Um, it's the director is Linda Good O'Brien, who some of you might know is the founder of Just Above Midtown Gallery, uh, which opened in New York in the 70s, and it was the first um, commercial gallery in New York at the time that had a focus on African-American artists and was run by an African-American woman. Um, she then decided that it was, well, she realised it was being subsumed, you know, African-American art into the market, and so she turned to filmmaking, and when she realised that filmmaking wasn't touching enough people, she turned to urban farming. Um, and so she's constantly thinking about what kind of infrastructure we need to create in order to best support life and artists, and artists supporting life. And so there's Linda, Raw, the ICA, the ICA is part of the University of Pennsylvania, and we're all of these different artistic infrastructures that are kind of coming together for seven weeks, uh, it's been postponed a hundred million times because of the pandemic, but it will happen next spring um, in Philadelphia. Um, and we're going to be working with yeah, an amazing group of, of faculty and fellows to explore what kind of artistic infrastructure we need. You know, that, that how should it function? What methodologies are in place? What kind of funding um, processes should we advocate for? Um, how do we best work with communities, with artists, and yeah, we'll be bringing this kind of like infrastructure sandwich together um, around it. So um, I'll let Fatima kind of end, I guess, by talking a bit, a little bit about Aurora's infrastructure and our team. Yes. Uh, these are just some of the different academy sessions that have taken place uh, in Dakar. Um, and yes, yeah, it's the ICA, and this is us. Mm -hmm. So, so um, the team is composed. We are something like eleven with Koyo. So we have uh, mo we are only women. At the beginning, it was not a choice. It happened to be like that. She was looking for people who will be able to run with her the institution. So the people she, she had chosen at the beginning, Marie Hélène, uh, was coming from um, financial background? Banking administration. Banking administration. And, and uh, Marie uh, Cissé was coming from language practices. <coughs> and uh, yes, she started like that. And from one way to another, uh, academy by academy, we have someone that we take into the <laughs> team, and Dilsi is one of those first women. And uh, so we just ended up having most women, 
supplying or showing interest for what we were doing at Row and working with us, etc. And finally, we decided that, yes, it could be a kind of statement knowing that in our context and in many contexts, uh, women figures are not the leaders in the art scene, even if they are a bunch of women when we are, you come in curatorial practice course, art history course, école des beaux-arts, etc. So yes, it ended up being something really important for us to just uh, push and uh, to put at the front line those women figures, especially in our context, who most of the very important role in the cultural administration are taken by politicians, in fact, and people who are not even trained in the art field and not knowing how to run a cultural policy. So uh, we have uh, among our team, so uh, Koyu is artistic director, Marie-Hélène, our director of program. We have also Marie Cissé, Dulcie and I program curator. Marie Cissé uh, in charge of co coordination and production. Farma in charge of uh, administration. We call her Bob Halis, so money, money maker. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we have also uh, Etola in charge of communication. So this is, uh, and we have, of course, <laughs> the people uh, without, uh, without them who won't run at all. It's uh, Tata Fatou, so they are on the left, Tata Fatou, uh, Aminata, and uh, just behind Kuyo, so the second woman on the right here, you have uh, Flavienne, so the housekeepers and the chief of row, so uh, feeding us and being really mum to us every single day, and I think that it won't work if they were not here, especially during row academy. And uh, so, of course, this institution, as Dulce mentioned it, and very rarely face a lot of challenge. Financial challenge are among the, the, the kind of challenge we face is as we don't get any public foundings, and uh, that makes the institution Fragile. But I think that in a certain way, the ecosystem we happen to build around us help us, help us sustain in a certain way the institution and we are part of different kind of network and among them Arts Collaboratory, which is a network of art institution, art institution from what we call the Global South and working together, building projects together and developing different kind of projects together. And uh, so yes, I think in one way or, or another we happen to do things and we find ways in which we can still build our program and develop them. But we have, yes, to say that COVID-19 was quite a thing for us as well. Most of the institutions face it and usually we are really proud to say that we can do whatever, we can. no matter how it works, we will find a way to do things. But I think that COVID brings most uncertainties for the future. But I think also that we are developing different kind of projects and finding ways to uh, reinvent ourselves because it's uh, pulled out uh, the fact that sometimes you are not able to gather with your audience and you have to find a way uh, to still be connected to them for, of course, sharing artistic practice, but also uh, being just here because it's a family. At the end of the day, we are all together in that boat and we have to find a way to make things happening. So yes, and we are really happy to be here and to share this with you guys. And of course with Alexia. Thank you and the co Park team. It was an amazing, amazing journey for us, really. Thanks everyone for coming and see you maybe in Dakar. <laughs> <laughs> There's no quarantine when you arrive. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've, got, um, we've got some nice refreshments and things. We'd love to offer everyone a drink and we can have a, a conversation over a drink. But I just wonder if there's any questions that people immediately have that they might want to open out and share or any thoughts, reflections on what we've heard today. It's, it's so interesting. I'm really interested in this idea of a sabbatical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and it touches on the conversation we just had Lucy here from Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art and Annie here as well. We were just talking there before we came in. Annie's from Scotland. And just organisations and, and the rethinking we're all doing at the moment after everything we've been through. It's forced a moment to rethink, mm -hmm. which, is, which is good. And how better can we work? do the work that we want to do, how can we better sort of support artists, the communities that we're in. So this idea of sabbatical, and I just wondered if you might do it again. 
of you. Yeah, I mean, we hope so. <laughs> um, I mean, the, yeah, I, I think I think we will. I think we're all, you know, we acknowledge that we're going to go through different chapters. Yeah. And we won't do academies forever. You know, there's there's a time also at which, you know, we have to reevaluate whether we are mm-hmm. responding to the contemporary needs. Of, of our of our context, mm-hmm. um, local, um, pan African and global. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we will, I think, and you know. Yes, I. No, no. I, I think that uh, you know, even COVID nineteen was a kind of uh, it was a forced sabbatical, but it was one. And I think that what pulled out was. What pulled out of COVID-19 is that we have to rethink our models and we have to, it's just not, we think about it, we have to think about it. So we rather take a moment to do it and do it well, or we don't do it at all and it's complicated. And uh, for example, at Raw, we have this meeting before we've been, we went to holidays with our board of advisory and what's, what we bring out of this is that we have to find a way to be all together and rethink some of the aspect of our program. For example, Raw Academy is an amazing program and we do many things there, but it's really complicated for uh, artists or practitioners from the continent to actually be in Raw Academy. So when you develop something where you want to give a a bigger place to uh, the people from your context and you can't, you are not able to do it, you have to rethink the model and to redevelop it. It doesn't mean that Raw Academy don't brings beautiful things, it just means that uh, we have to find a way to found the, the, the residency of those local or of those uh, fellow from the continent who are not able to afford a two weeks residency in Dakar and to eat in Dakar, Dakar being an expensive city. Of course, we host the whole lunch breakfast thing, but you have to pay for your rent, you have to, you know, so you see also the difference of chance and opportunities uh, depending of where the artists are from and where the fellows are from. And uh, we started rethinking that model with Raw Academy infrastructure in Philadelphia, and we are, we are really happy for that, but I think that Yes, we all think at Raw that we have to go through different ways to do things. And we can, of course, create something new. It's part of also of what we are doing and how we are doing it. And meetings, encounters, and the people we, we share our, yes, what interests and what is really important for us are we can build some th- things together and develop things all together. So, of course, we will do another sabbatical. <laughs> We don't know yet where and yeah. when and how, but I think it's part of the model now. Yeah, and I think just like one last word on that is that, you know, there's also, I think we all need to be a bit more creative with our budgets at this time. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, we, with Arts Collaboratory, this, this global network that we're part of, we share a, a common part of funding and we run that budget together, 26 organisations in you know, Asia, Latin America, the Middle East and Africa. And we were going through the budget the other day and we were going, okay, what would we usually put towards travel, um, even communication, you know, all sorts of budget lines that we just haven't spent in the last year and a half. What do we want to, where do we want to reallocate that? And we have this term, which is time strike. And so, you know, the different organizations in the network, they all have the right to a time strike and money from the common pot can go to help sustain an institution who is going to stop projects programming for a while and do some serious thinking. Um, so, you know, of course you need a little bit of money to do that, but how can we also think about where we were spending money before and actually taking it away from, from some of what was perhaps superfluous um, as well. So I think there's, there's ways of doing it. Um,